I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Roots and All podcast. This week I'm speaking to Giles Heap, Managing Director of CED Stone. CED has a long history of supplying natural stone paving and facilitating the use of stone throughout the landscape and construction industries. CED has a really excellent reputation with industry professionals and customers because they're approachable and quick to share their expertise. Giles also shows a lot of concern for environmental and sustainability issues. So, for example, it was really interesting that when I mentioned to Giles about flooding, His first question would be whether hard surfaces were really necessary in that instance, which I thought was a bit like a pub owner asking if you really need to get drunk tonight when you go to the bar to buy a pint. And this is a really non-standard response from someone whose job is to sell stone, but it does point to his genuine concern for environmental issues. We recorded the interview in Giles' office, which looks over the huge and busy yard at CED, full of lorries and forklifts and stone cutting and so on. So please excuse any background noises. The interview starts with Giles talking about what sustainability means to him and why we need to think about this when we're ordering materials for our gardens. From a sustainability point of view, as we talked about earlier, I think there are two things we need to look at. One is the ecological value of the stone, i.e. is it the right thing to use? Is it going to last a long time? Is it going to look nice? Where does it come from? Can you have uh, as low of carbon footprint as possible and, and all these sort of factors? And then there's the ethical side. So sustainability means different things to different people. To me, it's a combination of those two. It's a combination of finding something that is not wasteful in any way whatsoever and gets to market in a way that you can be comfortable with from a moral standpoint. Now, for me, that means trying to trade ethically. I, you know, we, we members of the UTI, and I could go on about that for a while, probably will do later. But the basis is that the stone comes from places where the workers and the environment are looked after. That's really what it comes down to. And treated in the way that you would like to be treated yourself, as much as is possible. From a carbon footprint point of view or an ecological point of view, I think the most important thing is whatever you use, Wherever it comes from, it's right for that job. Now, it might be that the the right thing for you to use is very, very cheap PC slabs, in which case use very cheap PC slabs. It might be that you just want something that looks a bit nice, it's probably not going to be there for a while, in which case, yeah, go and buy some some cheap Indian paving from somewhere. Don't expect it to last forever, but there are different grades of Indian paving, so some are great, some are not so good. I mean, that in itself is a different subject and, and could be talked about for hours on end, you know, where it's sourced from and, and how it's supplied. So we have such an amazing range of paving products in the UK, not just natural stone, but concretes and porcelains and various other weird and wonderful things as well. But you have to base it on what's right for the skin. The pros and cons of sourcing stone from overseas. Obviously, you can't have as much control over what happens in the production process over there, is that fair um, to say? I don't think that's entirely fair to say. We've got pretty good control over our supply chain. I wouldn't say control, we have good oversight. We know 98% of the time exactly where the stone comes from and how it's produced. And this is something that we've done, well, ever since we were you know, created sort of 40 odd years ago. We've known the quarry owners, we've known the quarries. We had to, to understand what we were trying to sell. As the sort of global market grows and is a lot more uh, obtainable for most people, it becomes more difficult to be aware of what your supply chain actually is and to be able to manage it. We spend a lot of time looking at our supply chain, both in the UK and abroad. And actually, sometimes it's more difficult to keep a track of something in Europe than it is in China. You know, it just depends on what the stone is. And you mentioned the ETI. Can you just expand on that a little bit? So the Ethical Trade Initiative, it's a group of businesses that have signed up to various set of base codes. The main ones are that there's no bonded or slave labour. The workers get a living wage in their local environment. They have access to, you know, um, education and health care, and preferably there's no child labour involved. It's fairly standard terms. The website can give you a lot of the uh, information. Now, there are currently a few stone firms in the UK involved, not that many, but a few. Ourselves, Marshalls, Hardscapes, one or two others. And it tries to promote 
or I suppose ethical trading, which is just doing business in a nice way, trying to make sure that the people you buy from are not enslaving people. They're not using bonded labor. They're not taking the mickey, basically. Yeah, this is something that we've, we've always tried to do, even before ethical trade became ethical trade. It's just the way we do business. I think currently we are achiever status, so I think there's only one of three, I think there's three companies in the UK that have that status. And for example, we have uh, two or three Indian suppliers, one of which who we worked with from the very beginning of importing Indian stone. We can guarantee through every tier of his business, which is the packaging factory, the production factory and the quarries themselves, that there is no child labour, there is no bonded labour. All the workers have good rights, they have access to clean water and food and they get time off and all this sort of thing. And I think we're probably one of the only companies that can actually definitely say that. But that's only one of our suppliers. The other two are very close to it and we're continuously working towards that. And actually it's People say, well, what's the point of it? And it's a very good example. When um, Callum Fraser, my commercial director, was out there last time and he looks after our ethical trading for me, he regaled me of a story. He said he spoke to some of the workers over there and the guys were so happy that they worked for this particular company. And the reason they worked for this particular company is because it was known to give good pay, to um, look after the workers, to make sure that they you know, had a bit of time. And, and people who worked there were very well, very much in demand, especially the boys and all the girls would rather go out with a guy that worked for this company <laughs> than worked for another company. So, so you know, <laughs> so people say, well, how does it work? Well, yeah, obviously it does, you know, and, and, and the point is that social change, it takes a long time, but it started. And because that started, and it started from a very grassroots point of view, then the people on the ground are going to expect more next time. So when jobs come up at a factory or a quarry, if you're not going to get the same or similar people aren't going to work there. So all the other owners are now going to have to up their game. And actually what we've seen is this slow snowball effect of it starting to make a difference. One thing we do have to bear in mind is of all the Indian paving produced, the UK imports about 4%, a whole of the UK. So actually, we don't really have that much influence. We can only do our best. Who imports the rest out of interest? Uh, most of it's internal in, in India, right. actually. I mean, you've got to bear in mind India is a massive place. Mm. But most of it is, I think, it's something like 85% is Indian and the rest is imported, exported to the rest of the world. But we, I think we're about 4% or something like that. I might be wrong, but it's that kind of mm. um, negligible amount, right. if you like. Okay. I was going to come on to this later, actually, but what other accreditations could people look out for when they're buying stone from a company? Well, obviously, ETI is good. The TFT have involvement as well. And I think that really the question to ask is just, are you members of some kind of ethical trade organisation or body? And if so, what do they do? To a degree, if you're really that worried about it, you kind of need to do your own research. Mm -hmm. Now, Stone Federation have started the Stone Fed GP. They have started their own system called the Ethical Trade Register, which is pretty much a register to guarantee that the people who are on the register have actually done something. It's done on a stone-by-stone -stone basis. The problem is I've got about a 1,000. So from my point of view, it doesn't really work for me because we just have too many at the moment. But I work very closely with Stonefed, and that's the sort of thing that we will eventually get onto as well. If people are really worried about it, I mean genuinely worried about it, and unfortunately I'd say most people actually don't really care, then do a bit of research on the company you're expected to buy from. Mm -hmm. I said people don't really care. That's maybe unfair, but... I can remember being at a, an event, an industry event, and I was honoured <clears throat> to be on the panel. And somebody asked me a similar question. So I actually turned around to the audience. I said, right, okay, we've got landscapers and designers here and contractors, hands up. And there were, I don't know, 90 or 100 people. There. I said, hands up the people who have been asked by their client where the stone was sourced from and is it ethical? Two people put their hand up and I know one of them was lying. <laughs> you know, it just, it, it, in our industry, it's a big thing because, to be fair, it was started off as a bit of a marketing ploy and then everyone thought, well, actually, hang on a minute, let's do something about this. Mm. So in our industry, it's become quite a big thing. And because we're in the industry, all of us, it becomes quite important, you know, to us, oh, is it sourced ethically? Well, yeah, it is. You know, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if it wasn't, mm. at least from my point of view. But Mr and Mrs Smith, they're not going to know about it in the same way that, it's only recently they've started questioning where their plastic packaging comes from, mm. you know, for their shops. And, and actually, do they want to have 10 Tesco's carrier bags when actually they could probably use a couple of Asda ones they had last week? It's a very slow process, but uh, yeah, it's, it's having an effect. 
We were talking earlier about the carbon footprint of certain products, and I would assume that if I were to buy recycled materials or materials that were sourced locally to where I was living or building a garden, that that would have the smaller carbon footprint. Is it fair to assume that, and are there trade-offs in other respects? I think it's fair to assume that if you're specifically talking about locally produced and sourced products, within reason. There will be some that aren't. At the end of the day, there is probably more embedded carbon in a locally produced cement paving flag than there is in a river Yorkstone. You know, whereas if you compared it to, I don't know, granite all the way from China, then there's probably more carbon in, in that. But conversely, concrete uses a hell of a lot of energy to produce in one form or another. But generally speaking, I would say if you've got something local and you can use it, do. And I think that's better anyway, not just for the environment. I think it's right for the local economies. Mm. You know, I think it's really important that we use the resources that we have locally within reason and appropriately and, and with some thought rather than transporting stuff from all over the world. What I don't agree with is using something that is local because it is local. You use it because it's appropriate. Now, that might be that it's better to bring something all the way from the other side of the world because it's just the right thing to do. Whether the carbon footprint is high or not, it might be that the product will last longer, it'll look better, and in the long term, it will be better for everyone. Uh, and you have to get that balancing act right. And if we were in the UK, what would be our options in terms of buying locally? It depends where you're from. Your part of the world, not a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm <stuck>. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty stuffed, yeah. There's, uh, there's a bit of sandstone down there, but it's very soft. The UK's got a lot of geology, a massive range of geology. I think I'm not probably wrong in saying that, uh, especially in sort of the north of Scotland, places like that, we probably have more types of stone per square mile than pretty much any other country in the world. That also has its cons. That means we've got lots and lots of little quarries, nothing of any really big production. Now, we have, obviously, the famous ones we have in the UK, Yorkstone, of which there is quite a lot. Some are good, some not so good, and they're all various different types. They're not all actually technically Yorkstones, but they're, you know, that kind of sandstone-based product. So if I start, from, say, from the south, from the southwest, you've got a couple of granites from Cornwall, which are quite nice. If you go sort of least a little bit from there, then you've got the Perbex and the Portland Stones, not all are really appropriate for use in paving, and that's something else we've got to bear in mind. We've got a lot of building stones in the UK, not so many that are good for paving, so I'll concentrate on that side of things. So you've got a couple of Perbex that are quite good. Portland can be used in the right situation. And then you get the odd weird ones like Ashburton limestone and stuff, or marble, they call it down there, which is very, very rare and very expensive. It uh, looks lovely, and you can't really use it for a big skin, but anyway, by the by. Now, if we go up from there, you can go into the Pennants from South Wales, and again, there's a couple of nice ribbon ones. The sawn pennant blue stuff it struggles a little bit, I think, and has done historically since the big quarries closed. But there are a couple of sources of that. There are a couple of other different types of stone in sort of Monmouthshire and places around that at the top of the seven. There's a nice um, sort of purpley red sandstone from that part of the world as well, which is quite good for outdoors. Then let's see if we go up the west coast. Um, we go up to North Wales, famous for slate. Two or three different types. Some good, some not so good. There is a granite in that part of the world, which is lovely but quite expensive and not really used for paving, although it probably could be. But again, I think it struggles a little bit with its sourcing. We move east a bit further, then you get into the Yorkstone gritstones, Pennine gritstones, things like Brinskull and stuff like that. Further up north, there's then not a lot. There's a couple of things in Cumbria, which I'll talk about in a minute. We go up into Scotland, then you've got windstone from the borders, which is a very dark, a very hard stone traditionally used. You see it all over the place. All the black curbs in Edinburgh and Glasgow are all windstone. We've helped develop a couple of sandstones out of Scotland as well in the last two or three years, and also a granite called Grampian granite, which is a very nice, or very light silver, silver with a hint of yellow to it. And then, <clears throat> I suppose, a bit further up the top, you've got the Caithness from Caithness from Wick and Thurso, places like that. That is, uh, again, a lovely stone, mostly riven, so quite a low carbon footprint because there's not a lot of energy used to produce it. On the downside, you've got to get it from the very tip of Scotland. So from that point of view, it's got slightly more mm -hmm. carbon because of the fuel to get it down south. Of course, if we go down the route of electric lorries, like we were talking earlier, then yeah, right. that might change things slightly. Anyway, but that's a different subject. And that's kind of really it. I mean, there's going to be one or two others that I've forgotten off the top of my head. But, you know, one of the things I'm trying to do is to 
help and develop new sources of dimensional paving stone in the UK. So we've worked very hard to bring on this Scottish one, which is a lovely granite. A couple of sandstones, as I say, from that area. Look a bit like Yorkstone, a little bit pinkier. Again, very nice. And I think in time, that's something that will produce to a reasonable level. We recently developed and helped to bring bring in a green schist, which is a lovely green stone uh, from the west of Scotland. And uh, that's had some issues, but at the moment that's being laid at uh, Wimbledon. I'm not sure if I'm actually allowed to say that, but I think I am. We're too late now. So that's that's being laid at Wimbledon Tennis Courts. And I have to say, it looks stunning. It's absolutely gorgeous. But it's been a bit of a learning curve because it's a new quarry. It's never been used like this before. And there have been some hiccups along the way. But you know, I think we're pretty much through that now. It's taken two years, which is what I'd roughly expect. Mm-hmm. And then just recently, we've been helping a company called Armstrong's and they own the old Shap quarry. Now, Shap is a very unusual granite from Cumbria. It was traditionally used for sets and curbs, for a lot of cladding, a lot of plinths and cornices and things like this. And indeed, you'll see Shap all over the UK. Quite a stunning granite. There were two types, a dark one and a light one. Well, that quarry is now just starting to ramp up for dimensional stone again. It's been aggregate for a very long time. So we're going to go through some issues of fractures and things like this. But once we get out of that, and I'm helping them, in fact, I'm going up there again tomorrow, having another chat with the quarry owners, take them on sort of the next level. I'm hoping that in uh, six months to a year, we'll have a reasonably good production available of, of that, at least in, in smallest quantities. The issue we have with British stone is we don't have enough to cater for the demand in the UK. And we will always have to import. And that's just a fact. Interesting. But there are new quarries coming online. Yeah, slowly. But obviously, you know, a lot of my old quarries that have been maybe been reopened. But the reality is we only have a, a very finite availability of stone that could be used for paving. Not all stones are capable of coping with the, the kind of rigours that they have to go through. Like, so you've got sandstones down in Sussex and they're lovely, but they're soft as hell. You couldn't use them for, for paving in any real form whatsoever. And you get that all over the UK. Indeed, there's a lot of York stones that really you can't use. So a lot of stone you just can't use it. So yes, we have a lot of it, but we actually can't use a lot of it as well. Right. So if we were buying, say, a bag of stones, are there things we should look out for in that, in terms of sustainability? A bag of stones. Buy a bag of stones. A pebbles. bag of stones. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a bag of stones, you know. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. Uh, sustainability, again, it's... It, what do you mean by sustainability? Well, if I was to go and buy a bag of purple slate chips, would they have had a more intensive production process? Would they have travelled further? Would they have been imported? You know, what kind um, of things might should I have The chances are something like slate would have come from North Wales and the process there would be blasted out or, or crushed. So not a huge amount of processing. There would be a little bit, but not a lot. If you're really worried about a carbon footprint, to that extent, would be in the transportation to your doorstep. And if that's a concern, then you're better off using something that is local to you. So down in Sussex, in that part of the world, then you'll probably get a flint gravel from South London, or you might even get some of the sort of sandstone you gravels you get on the South Coast, ringway, places like that. Mm-hmm. But they're different. They look different. But with, with pebbles and, and aggregates, it, there's so little true energy use involved in producing them, Mm. that it's fairly negligible. And the reality is most of the products, they won't go straight from Wales to you. They'll end up going from Wales to maybe a banking facility in the Midlands. That will come down to a distribution point in somewhere else and that will get distributed to a dozen different sites and you'll go to your local builder's merchant and you'll pick a couple of bags up. But the reality is the amount of bags you get on the lorry, it's such a small amount, it's hardly worth worrying about. Is there a particular stone that is very efficient in its production process in as much as every last bit of it can be used or are they all like that? The ideal solution for any quarry is that they use 100% of their product. The reality is it's impossible. If you have, for example, a dimensional stone, now that's a stone that is cut into three dimensions, then some of that will be unusable for paving or sets or or cladding or curving, whatever else. It might only be a small amount, but some of it. And when you're cutting it, you're cutting it, so that bit of the blade is being turned into dust. So actually, you can't physically use all 100%. Now, I'm going to be a bit facetious there, I suppose, but um, most quarries, if they've got any sense, they will have at least 85% usage. 
possibly a bit more. And in many cases, even that last little bit will end up going to be crushed for aggregate or something along those lines. So generally speaking, it's pretty efficient. There are a few that aren't run that way because you can't, for whatever case it happens to be. It might have no use as an aggregate. It might just be you're going to end up with a load of random cut-up bits which end up in a pile somewhere. And indeed, we talked about Welsh Slate earlier. There was a very famous Welsh Slate company who went down the pan because they didn't manage their waste. And they ended up with, you know, literally tens of thousands of tonnes of waste in the part of the quarry they actually needed to get to. There were some other issues there as well, but it, it, it is a very, very important factor. And actually, for most quarries, managing the waste is almost a bigger headache and a more important part of their business than producing the product. The well. difference being that the wastage that's produced there, it wouldn't go into landfill, and if it did... It's natural anyway. Exactly. So, so it doesn't really matter too much from, from a, an environmental point mm. of view. And indeed, a lot of quarries will use their waste to backfill the quarry anyway. Mm. As they dry out the bit, they finish off the bit they're working on and they're going to use it again, they'll backfill. It's not really something to be too concerned about from a consumer's point of view. And how does the quarry affect natural habitats? That all depends on the quarry. In the UK, there's an extraordinarily strict set of planning policy rules that you have to jump through. And indeed, in many cases, it's possibly too strict. The reality is you can't completely protect the local habitat. But what you can do with quarrying is create another one behind it. The biggest issue with quarrying is just keeping control of the dirt and the dust and making sure that that doesn't affect the local area in one way or another. And the reality is if there is, you know, if there are animals, the great crested newt, whatever it happens to be, that was the famous one, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, then you have to take a decision. And the decision is, is... Is it more important to have the product or to keep the great crested dune? And there will be people who think one way and people who think the other. Is there a right answer? I don't know. I'm, thank God I don't have to make that decision. There is a massive issue with the stone industry in the UK in that it is very, very difficult to get extension for or open a new quarry. Is it? Really difficult. And most applications fail. Right. Often, for no good reason whatsoever, other than... Um, you know, Mrs. Jones around the corner doesn't want it to open. And it's a bit of a NIMBY situation. What we have to bear in mind is we have a massive, really, really long heritage of quarrying in the UK. And if you're using stone in the UK, you know, we've, we've got stone buildings from 3,800 BC that are still in existence. You know, and, and we use stone in the landscape back in 2000 BC. You know, look at Stonehenge or Kalanish or places like that. So we've got a really, really long history of using stone. And we had a very, very good quarrying industry up until maybe the sort of end of the First World War. But things change and things move on and, and, you know, we've lost a lot of that heritage. But conversely, we've had other products we could use in the meantime and many of those products have been concrete-based. And I think people are now starting to become round to the understanding that, well, maybe concrete isn't the right thing to use, always. And sometimes it's better to dig a hole in the ground and use what nature has given us rather than dig five holes or three holes in the ground, mix it all together, heat it up, and use all that energy that's involved in that to create something we could have just dug out the ground once. So there's, you know, I mean, obviously there's arguments for and against that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of an issue. And, and actually, you know, for us to be able to develop, I mean, in the last five years, we've, we've helped bring on, what, five new stones? Six, actually, one in Northern Ireland as well. I've forgotten about that one. That's quite a lot. To be fair, mm. it is, really is quite a lot. And I think there's more acceptance now that using stuff locally is probably better in total for the country and for the world than having somebody else do it in a different country. Yeah. Even if that means the poor old Great Crested New might have to find a new home. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's a tough one. It is. It is mm. a bit. Flooding is obviously an issue where you put in a lot of non-permeable material. Yeah. How could you get round this if you were laying stone? First question I'd ask is, do you have to lay something that's non-permeable? Second question I'd ask is, do you have to actually lay anything? Obviously, the second question normally answers the first one. So if you want a hard surface of some sort, whether it be a patio or a driveway, there are ways of getting around the issues of surface drainage. Now, that could be water strained off traditionally into you know, channels, drainage channels, and then into 
retention tanks and, and then into the ground, or it could be they're off into the sewers. And that's the issue, it's, it's water draining off back into the main sewers and back onto the streets. If we want to keep water on site, which I think we really do, it would make a lot of sense to keep the rain on site, then, yeah, there are ways of designing hard surfaces that are permeable. Now, traditionally, we've used quite a lot of block paving in the UK. Technically, that's permeable. The problem with it is it becomes impermeable over a period of time because the block pavers are laid so close together that the gaps, the joints, fill up with dirt and detritus and, and they become pretty much impermeable. And indeed, often underneath the sand and or aggregates is maybe laid directly onto clay, in which point they can't go anywhere and it floods. So there's, there's lots of issues. It's not just a case of what happens on top, it's what happens underneath, and actually that's probably more important. Now, if you can get the drainage underneath working, so that it doesn't all collect in one pool, and especially down here in the southeast, southeast where we are very clay-based, that's kind of important. Then you can lay stone without cement. You can lay it with joints. You can lay it with aggregate that allows water to percolate through. And depending on how many joints you have and how big they are, will will dictate how much flow of water you can have through it. It's perfectly possible to design a driveway with plugs or sets that has more than enough permeability to persuade any council, you know, and then make sure that you've got enough flow through it without any great expense. But you have to think about it. Every trade-off is a trade-off. And on the one hand, it's, it gives you more permeability. On the other hand, it's maybe not quite as stable. So the surface has to be designed slightly differently. It's just understanding what the questions are to ask. Mm-hmm. But it's certainly doable. Yeah. Yeah, certainly okay. doable. And I'd encourage it, actually. Yeah. And I should also actually add to that, you can also lay stone... Bound. So, okay, so there's two types. There's unbound and bound. Unbound means no cement. Bound means cement. Now, traditionally, we've always thought of unbound as being permeable. It's not always, but it's probably assume it is for now. So you can have a permeable paving or driveway, which uses no cement. You can also have a bound paving, a patio or driveway, which does use cement, if you use the right type of mortars. So there are systems that you can do you can use will, will allow that. Now, companies like Steintech have been doing it commercially for a long time. We've been developing a mortar with them. And I've been saying this for about two years. It's just about to come out. It really is just about to come out, probably April time, called Stonebed, which is a permeable bedding mortar. Now, this means that any moisture that does get underneath can flow away. And actually, you can lay it in such a way that the water just flows through the joints into the stone bed and then flows away. So it's it's perfectly doable. Mm-hmm. So if you're not comfortable with laying it loose, as we used to traditionally, or unbound, I should say, then we can do it bound. And if you were laying it unbound, what could be one potential problem that we might have to get our heads around? I think that the main one with unbound is understanding movement, bizarrely. Not movement of water, but actually movement of the surface, i.e. the stone or, or paving or sets or whatever it happens to be. You need to be able to mitigate that in such a way that, example, so if you lay flags on an aggregate, and now if they're sawn flags, like a granite flag or an Indian sandstone that's been sawn, it's got a very smooth bottom. That means it can move laterally quite easily. Now, if you want to stop that, which we do, you're probably going to have to put some kind of what I call a structural spacer to create the joints and to hold them in place. Now, that system, the whole paving area is then going to have to be constrained. So at some point, you're going to have to have a, a hard edge, hedge that can't move. And I'm not talking a piece of wood or a bit of metal, because they can, they, they can move and they can flex. To a degree, it's not too much of an issue, because you're going to expect some kind of movement. But you want to try to reduce it as much as possible. Whereas if, for example, we used crop sets, now crop sets are all individually random and rough, so they key into the aggregate really well. And in that case, you could actually lay them light block paving, banged up right up against each other and just fill it with, with the sand. Now, in time, that might not be as permeable as the paving with the joints because the smaller joints in the sets would slowly fill up with dirt. So it's understanding what you're trying to achieve now, what you're trying to achieve in the future, what the aesthetic needs to be, and then we look at what the solutions for those are. And every site is slightly different as well. So what is the future of stone? Oh, it's going to outlast us. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> What's the future? I, to be honest, I, I still think there's going to be a greater demand for it, even though there is now. And, you know, this is something we've seen grow in the last 40 years. The company started in 1978, so nearly 41 years now. And over that period of time, we were the first people to start importing European granites into the UK in any big way. 
and then one of the first people to start importing Chinese granites, and then one of the first to start importing Indian sandstones. And we've been doing this for a long time, and our whole premise, our whole company was built on solving people's problems. So we would go, you know, somebody would say, oh, you've got this, these lovely aggregates, but have you got any granite sets? Oh, don't know, let's go and find out. So you know, we'd get on a phone or drive to Portugal or whatever and find some granite sets, and then we'd start importing those. And because we then imported those, other people would go, well, that's nice. Can I have it in the paving flag, please? And then we'd go and find those. And, and as you continually develop that availability, then people's imagination starts to take hold, at which point the demand gets more. You need to find something else, something new, what's different. And then we end up with the kind of range we have now, which is, I think, the biggest range of natural stone in the UK. Of all types, not just paving, but aggregates and cobbles and boulders and rockery and God knows what else. So in many ways, I think the demand for stone and for the range of stone has come about because of companies like us who have gone out there and found them, you know, and made it available. And the more availability there is, then the more demand there is. Because more and more people go, oh, I like that. I didn't like what you had before, but I like that. Uh, and that continues to develop. So, yeah, I think uh, there's that side of things. In other words, uh, the availability and, and enabling designers like yourself to really use your imagination and push the boundaries a bit. But also I think there's a much greater understanding of the benefits of using natural stone as well. People are really starting to come around to asking the right questions as opposed to, what well, is stone, it comes from China, it must be bad. Why must it be? You know, is there a difference between the stone from China or a concrete produced in uh, Staffordshire, for argument's sake? But actually, there's lots of differences. Understanding what they are will naturally lead you to an answer to your question. And it might be that the concrete's better. Not always, though. So. Mm. And if we look on a whole life basis, most of the time, if you use the right stone, stone will outlast any scheme. And if it doesn't, then you've not designed it right. How can people get hold of you or find out more about CED? I don't exist. I'm a figment of your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want anyone to get hold of me. No, that's not true. <laughs> Look, it, 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 I'm, I'm available. I'm always available. And if, if you want to get hold of me, website's uh, cedstone.co.uk. All the contact information's on there. If you just want to have a look at the website, we are developing it. Hopefully there'll be a new one coming online in two or three months. It's a big process. It's not quick. It's not like... You know, looking on the internet and doing a GoDaddy type website. This has taken some doing. So we're hoping that'll be out later this year. But yeah, so website, I'm normally contactable in one form or another. Drop me an email. And if I don't want to talk to you, I'll pass you on to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really grateful to Giles for the interview. He's incredibly generous with his knowledge. And as he mentioned, he had a long drive ahead of him that evening and still took the time out to talk to me. I think it's clear from the interview that we need to think about what we're buying, where we're buying it from and what the implications are of our purchasing decisions. Giles explains really well why you might want to consider going to a specialist with strong links to and a clear oversight of their supply chain so things are traceable and people can be held accountable along the way. What I got from speaking to Giles is the fact that it's a complicated issue and maybe we don't have all the information we need to always make informed purchasing decisions at this stage of the game. And as Giles says, the onus is on us as buyers or specifiers to do the research and ask the questions. And the more we all ask the questions, the more suppliers will realise they need the answers to these questions. I thought it was really interesting as well what Giles says about the nimbyism that prevents quarries opening up or getting extensions. Are we guilty of kicking the can down the road? Is it sometimes the case that we want to buy stuff as long as it gets manufactured somewhere else and we don't have to deal with the manufacturing processes and all that entails? It is food for thought. So, as I say, thank you to Giles and thanks to you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.